As we've experienced in the past two years, technology and education have become inseparable. My next guest is taking it one step further. She's called the VR lady. We we're just talking about her for her work in human and computer interaction, particularly in native rural communities. Welcome Dr. Angelina Dayton, Senior Virtual Reality Research Scientist at Virtual World Society. Uh, Dr. Dayton, um, I have, you know, just had a lot of fun at South by Southwest. I was sort of, you know, getting immersed in some of this stuff. And then I left it and I kind of felt I was going through withdrawal because I'm back in D.C. and I don't have easy access to that. Maybe I do at home, but who knows? But but I mean, just to come back to my point, as we're looking at immersive technologies and what they can do to us and some of the incredibly great things you have done. I guess my question is, you know, on the front end of of these questions about dense, high performance networks, do we have a have and have not problem developing that we need to be aware of? First, thank you for having me. And um, if you need any help getting into a headset, <laughs> I put tens of thousands of people in headsets, I'd be happy to help you. And yes, there is a have and a have not sector of our society, but that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the price of headsets have come down. They're available at your local Walmart. Um, but connectivity is, is difficult because uh, we do have these rural communities. I'm sitting right now in Oklahoma and about a block away from where I'm sitting, there's a sign that says, coming soon, high speed internet. And so you find that the digital divide isn't so much spatial in that you have to get a, a router in your house, it's temporal in that the amount of time people have spent not being connected or not having digital literacy is where you feel the most um, impact from that, that have and have not perspective. Well, can you share with our audience um, the work you've done with so many rural native communities? My understanding is you've now worked with tens of thousands of people in native communities in these immersive um, experiences. You know, my family, by tradition, is from Bartlesville, Oklahoma. So we lived, you know, very close to a lot of uh, you know, the Cherokee Nation, other, other areas. And, and when you would look at economic development and opportunity, there were glaring um, flamboyant gaps in opportunity uh, in that state. I also worked for the state of New Mexico, same thing. I'm really interested in whether or not some of the work you're doing may at some point help, help these next generations leapfrog into equity. I don't know if that's the right way to frame it, but I think that ought to be a goal. So I got the name, the VR lady, because when I would take headsets to schools, the kids would run out in the playground to the gate and say, the VR lady's here, the VR lady's here. <laughs> um, and so I kind of took that on as my name. And uh, through the American Indian Resource Center, hmm. um, they made a large push in Cherokee Nation to bring out virtual reality headsets to a number of school districts. And so at least some of the kids got a chance to see some of the emerging tech and the possibilities. So far as um, economic possibilities, I think Brian, uh, spoke very clearly about how the Department of Labor and other government company um, industry partnerships can help to push uh, for program support so that we get what I call fiber to first paycheck, where we get all of the support we need for rural communities to really make a change, that they have fiber in their home, they have connectivity at their schools, they have the training available that they need because they have 5G um, in their training centers um, in order to secure that job that they need. And I think Oklahoma has a great opportunity right now because Cherokee Nation actually does have fiber rolling out soon. And uh, a number of tribes have taken the money uh, that the federal government has given us and invested in fiber. What we need to do though is connect all of the pieces. And to that, I would say that um, when you talk about connecting the un unconnected, that's an iterative process. And we need to make space within our policy to say, um, first, we need to listen to the people that don't have to see what they need. Because one of the programs we had was to reduce the cost of your internet locally. And the way that you do that is to go online, have low cost internet for people who don't have it. Um, and But you had to go online and fill out a form on the internet in order to get that subsidy. Mm -hmm. And so it's really useful to have the um, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, have those people who are unconnected for a number of reasons in those conversations, and then to have those conversations throughout our program development and throughout our policy development. And I think that's where uh, DEI issues um, 
are not something that we think of later on, but we really see as the strength and the support of having very successful programmatic or policy development. You know, I, I don't know the answer to this question. It may not, um, you know, we may not be there yet, but when I think about the opportunities you're creating, it creates opportunities for upskilling, experiences, education. And so credentialing has got to become part of this at some level because when employers are looking at what do people know, they're looking for that little badge. Does the badging and credentialing system keeping up with the, the VR environment and immersive um, training environments that you're seeing come online or is there a gap there? So the same thing happened uh, when we started doing online schooling. If you mm. remember the first uh, um, courses that we took in college, they said, is it really a college course if you take mm -hmm. it on the internet? And so whenever there's an introduction of a new medium, you get that kind of, you know, is it as good as the thing we already had? And um, it's just a part of paradigmatic shifts where we get a little bit afraid. And it in some respects, they are keeping up with the credentialing, and in some respects, they're not. It depends on the industry. It depends on um, many factors, what the credentialing institutions say are acceptable or not acceptable. You can get a teaching credential online now. That used to not be possible. Um, and so I think you're going to see a gradual shift in um, the opportunities that you'll be able to do in virtual reality once um, it gains a little bit more legitimacy. Because remember, online universities or online courses, we weren't sure about it. Online dating didn't used to be a thing. And now so many people met their spouse online and are constantly finding their latest boyfriend on their phone app. And so I think it'll just be a, a matter of time. I once told people in a meeting that we'd be doing our banking online and they told me I was crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> so I say it, it will catch up. It's just a matter of time. Well, look, let's make a deal with each other. And I don't know if this is unrealistic, but I want to do an event or a program down the road where I'm in a, we create a VR experience. We're probably going to do a little bit performative because not we won't have everybody on, on headsets who are watching this, but I want to interact with other people and have somehow that broadcast out to people so they can see, in fact, our experience one, with one another in a, in a VR way. And you'll have to help me construct that. And we'll have to bring we some do. of the students from Cherokee Nation uh, into that. We do that all the time at Virtual World Society. We'd be happy to help. That is and, awesome. And it is, it is the future. So be happy. And it's absolutely possible. So just give me a call. All right. Well, great. Well, listen, Dr. Angelina Dayton, Senior Virtual Reality Research Scientist at Virtual World Society, the VR lady, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.